Great. Thanks very much, Rod. Uh, it's been several years that I've been coming to this course and it seems to keep getting bigger every year. Rod does such a great job with the faculty program and uh, the facilities here are really spectacular. So uh, welcome. And I'm sorry, I'm a little late. My flight had some issues today. So uh, we are going to talk about MIS approaches to adult deformity. Um, I think it's a topic that will have increasing relevance to all of you because you're going to be practicing uh, at a time when we have a very large population of people who are going to have troubles with uh, adult onset deformity. I do have some disclosures. Um, they are here. So uh, according to the World Health Organization, in 2025, we're going to have 8 billion people in the world, and 800 million of them are going to be over age 65. And of that number, um, 70 million will be living in the United States. And that's almost double uh, what, what the number of age over 65 folks was just about 15, 20 years ago. So that's a, a huge number of people, and this is just the pictographic representation of that. And the darker the green on the lower part in 2025, the more elderly the population percentage. And the upper graph there is 1995. So you can see in a 20 year span how the population is really going to age, and um, they're gonna need to have someone treat them, which is all of you. So we're gonna to have to need, need to treat more patients with uh, adult small deformity. They uh, don't want to be sitting around and retiring. Um, I see patients in their 70s working full time, uh, owning their own businesses, running around doing things, um, vacationing, going all over the place, and uh, they wanna be active and they're not going to um, uh, let the deformity slow them down. I think that's a generational shift from maybe 30 years ago when people, once they reach 65, really did sort of retire and didn't do anything. Um, and we have to avoid morbidity for those folks, uh, especially once they get 65, 70 plus. Uh, their ability to withstand complications is not as robust as someone who's young. So, um, you know, we talk about all these things, and we're going to talk about some of these things this afternoon, you know, doing all these osteotomies to correct spinal deformity and flat back and trying to realign people and giving them a good sagittal balance. Yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, the issue becomes, um, what do these osteotomies do in terms of complication rates? Because the uh, complication rates are not small for doing this kind of thing. Um, the greater the, the degree of the osteotomy, typically the more blood loss that you get. Uh, the more blood loss that you get uh, and the longer your operation takes, the more comor comorbidities come into play. And you get age over 70 population, they're going to have comorbidities. And uh, so, you know, we, we can keep doing these things, and this is all good for people who can tolerate it, but what happens to people who cannot tolerate it? Um, and is the 80-year-old osteopenic going to tolerate that much correction? So uh, some of these uh, issues have been looked at in the past. Um, we did a review of our uh, population that we did PSOs, found plenty of complications. We're not alone. Uh, the group from St. Louis and, and some, several other groups have published a lot of complications. Uh, including cardiovascular problems, neurological deficits, coagulopathies, wound infections, uh, hematomas, DVTs, PEs, MIs, and rarely even vision loss. It's not a, a, an operation that, uh, that people um, can get away with uh, without some complication. And when we look at the risk factors for these major perioperative complications, and this was a study uh, that Frank Schraub ran through the ISSG and looked at 953 patients, these were the things that uh, made a difference. And basically, uh, demographics and some of their common comorbidities didn't really have that much impact on their complication rate. But the number of stages of, of approach and uh, which approach you took was very significantly associated with the number of complications that these people had. So if we, if we talk about that, the major complications are very procedure related. So the conclusion of that study is that basically, um, some of these risk factors that we always think about, BMI, number of comorbidities, they, those have a role, but the real big role uh, is surgeon control parameters, the number of stages of surgery and what kind of surgery that you do. So this is why people decided to take a look at doing these cases MIS. And um, you know, MIS does pretty well for one and two level degenerative disease. Uh, for the most part, the operations are fairly interchangeable with open surgeries for things like T-lift, for spondylolisthesis. Uh, and the questions are, can we do this um, for open deformity surgery in lieu of open deformity surgery, and, and will these same parameters hold? And so when we talk about that, um, one of the things that we have to consider is what are the parameters that we're going to look at uh, for uh, patients who have 
this kind of problem. And um, so who can tell me how you measure the SVA? Um, let me just get randomly through the list here. Let's go with... Uh, Ken Randall from University of Maryland. Are you here? Yeah. Okay. How do you measure the SVA, Ken? You drop a C7 plumb line from the center of the C7 vertebral body straight down and then measure the distance from the, the anterior portion of the L5-S1 disc space to the... Anterior portion of the L5-S1 disc space? Are you sure about that? Posterior. Yeah. Posterior. Yeah. Okay, good. So this, this is a problem when I know your name. <laughs> Other people who, who I may have bumped into during my travels. Uh, let's see. Um, I haven't bumped into this one. But uh, how about Kamran Saifi? Are you here? Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. All right, Kamran, how do you measure the pelvic incidence? Um, so you want to draw out over both femoral heads, and then you make a line connecting both femoral heads. And then from the center of that line, uh, you draw a line to the center of the uh, sacrum. Uh huh. And then? And then you, uh, so, and then it's uh, connected straight, straight uh, vertical. Straight vertical. No, it's not straight vertical. It is an angular measurement. So you, you, you've got the first line correct from center of sacral heads to the center of the, of the, the center of the femoral heads to the center of the sacrum. But the second line is not a straight vertical. Um, let's see. Let us ask. Uh, that's the pelvic tilt, actually, yeah. Let us ask um, Marcus Mazur. Are you here? Yeah, right here. Okay, Marcus, what is the second line? It's from the center of the sacrum at a 90 degree angle to the uh, uh, slope of the sacrum to the that's femoral right. head. Yeah, so it's, it's a perpendicular from the center of the sacral end plate. That's correct. Okay, good. And um, let's ask uh, Fernando Alonso. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Fernando, how do we um, measure the lumbar lordosis? I know it's associated to the degree of pelvic incidence, but I don't know exactly how to measure it. Yeah. Okay. So um, these are topics which, just for those of you who take the neurosurgery board exams anyway, including the written one and your recertification, which you guys are really not quite there yet, but um, that are likely to come up. This is not stuff that I was taught in my residency at all, but they, they are definitely going to come up in your, in your future. So probably need to learn that. Um, let's ask uh, Carolina Benjamin. Are you here? Yep. Okay. What do you think, Carolina? How are we going to measure lumbar lordosis? end plate of S1, and then you can um, figure out a Cobb angle from there. Okay, that's that's very good. I usually go with superior end plate of L1 to S1, but that's okay. And um, so let's look at some of these parameters here. And what is the relationship of ideally the pelvic incidence to the uh, lumbar lordosis? And let's ask um, Dan Felbaum. Are you here? Uh, ideally, it's a mismatch. Yeah, try to keep it less than 10 degrees is your goal, and that, that's usually associated with fairly good outcomes if you can get it around 10 degrees or less. That's very good. Okay, so let's look at a little cartoon demonstrating how you measure all these little things. So this is measurement of the SVA. Do you take the plumb line from C7? Oh, apparently first we're going to go with lumbar lordosis. Sorry. I can't remember with the sequence that the cartoon goes in. So that's the L1 to S1. And there's your angle of lumbar lordosis. This is your SVA, C7 plumb line. Then find the posterior superior corner of the 5-1 disc space. And here's your pelvic incidence. In this example, the femoral heads are 
perfectly aligned. If they were off alignment, then you take the midpoint between the two femoral heads, and then you take a perpendicular to the center of the sacral, um, and then that's essentially your pelvic incidence there, and then that should be within 10 degrees of your lumbar lordosis. So what that means to us is that people can have a pelvic incidence that is really high and require a lot of lumbar lordosis, and people can have a pelvic incidence which is low and get away with 15, 20 degrees of lumbar lordosis. And the thing that used to confuse people is uh, that you know folks would come into the clinic, you would get an x-ray, x-ray would show 25 degrees lumbar lordosis, and people say, oh, that's probably fine not get a full length, you know, 36 inch long cassette, not look at what is the overall picture of what the patient looks like, and then basically think that 30 degrees of lumbar lordosis was good for everybody, but it's not true. Um, you know, people who have high pelvic incidence need to have a lot more lordosis. Um, in addition to that, one of the other things that I think about, you know, just because we're treating patients with 5-1 spondees not infrequently, is what is the angle of the sacral slope? You get a high sacral slope, but the sacrum that's getting vertical, the forces to pull L5 off of S1 are much higher. Those people typically require a lot more lumbar lordosis than someone who has a relatively flat horizontal sacrum. So other things that, that you can think about there. This is how things should look if you were doing post-op, pre-op versus post-op planning. You want to end up, you know, in this situation where your angle of lumbar lordosis is roughly equivalent to your uh, pelvic incidence. Okay, so um, let's talk about some of what uh, people did as recently as 2012, 2013, which uh, as time goes is actually fairly early in the experience of MIS deformity, and it's, it's surprising how fast this has progressed in just a few years. Um, but uh, looking at just DGEN T lifts, uh, people were having shorter length of stays and costing less money to this to, uh, to, uh, for a uh, you know, DRG-based diagnosis than if they had uh, open surgery for T-lift, so what about doing this for MIS deformity? And these are the questions that you should be asking yourself. Can you decompress uh, often through a tube or indirectly with a, with a lateral approach? And certainly you can do that. Uh, can you place hardware safely? Um, we've gotten better at the doing that than, than we were a few years ago. Can you restore sagittal balance? And that was a problem with a lot of the early work in MIS uh, deformity surgery, that they weren't restoring sagittal balance. And I'll show you some of those papers. And can you match the lumbar lordosis to pelvic incidence within 10 degrees? And some people in the early experience of doing this kind of surgery did not do that. How long is it going to take to do? Are you going to be sitting there all day fluoroscoping yourself and the patient? And uh, can you get a successful fusion? So um, you know, I, I put some maybes in here because people had trouble with some of this stuff. And um, you know, this is some of the early work. This was from uh, Neil, uh, who I think is here today, or is coming. Uh, who talked about um, his early experience in 23 patients in 2010 that he tried MIS deformity. And uh, here's his table of his complications. So he's got dysesthesias in 17 out of 23 patients from doing a lateral approach. He's got a, two quadriceps palsies, um, which means you know, the patients really have trouble walking with that one. Um, he's got a renal hematoma, cerebellar hemorrhage, uh, some screw issues indicating essentially that he probably had pseudoarthrosis. So, um, you know, this is okay to do, but wasn't spectacular in 2010. Um, this is Adam's article um, from the group in Pittsburgh, and they had a bowel perforation on one of the laterals. And why would you get that problem? Um, let's ask. Uh, Marco Mendoza, are you here? Yeah. Okay, Marco, why would you potentially get a bowel perf on a deformity case from doing lateral approaches? What's the difference between that and doing a DGEN case? Because you really don't hear about this kind of trouble on a DGEN case. Um, no, I'm not. I think with the degenerative scoli case, you're more concerned that the, um, the relationship, with the, I guess, that bowel is more tethered and potentially in your way more so than with a regular degenerative case. So, you know, what happens with these adult deformity cases, a lot of them have lumbar rotational scoliosis as well. So what happens is structures that are typically not in your way on a degen case get rotated into your way on a deformity case. 
So that's why Neil in the previous one, he's got a kidney issue. Here we've got a bowel issue. These structures on the average lateral degen case and a straight spine are not in your way, but they get rotated right into your path. If you if you you got to look at that pre-op image and, and look at you know what's in the way, and uh, and not assume that the deformity case is exactly like the degen case. Um, you know the ultimate example of this is uh, did anybody see Bob Heary's uh, case report in JNS earlier this year on a lateral approach that had bilateral iliac injury. I don't know, maybe you guys didn't see that. It was a, a case with some mild, I think, rotational deformity. It was done in an outpatient setting, a one-level uh, lateral case. And uh, they uh, unfortunately put the um, retractor, et cetera, uh, through both iliac veins. And uh, actually could not stop the bleeding, couldn't take that retractor out, it actually wrapped the patient in uh, IABAN and shipped him like that, intubated in the lateral position to UMD and J, where Bob tried to extract the thing and repair both iliac veins, which um, they actually, the patient actually survived that operation uh, with sacrifice, I think, of at least one of those veins. And then uh, ultimately, the patient six or eight weeks later passed away from complications. So yeah. stuff that's not in the way can be in the way in these deformity cases. Uh, Juan is particularly good at and his preoperative scans to look for that kind of stuff. Maybe we can have one make a comment. Yeah, no, no, Praveen. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a great moment to discuss a little bit on, on that paper because um, when you look at that paper, you have to understand that the problem is not the lateral surgery. Yeah? The problem was in the way that was delivered, the setup, you know, doing this one without significant complications in a ambulatory setup. It's like you do it on a leaf in an ambulatory setup. You make a hole in the jugular, I mean, no, sorry, in the uh, cava. Then the patient has to be transferred to a big center. The patient die later on. Then you cannot come and say that the a leaf is a bad procedure. What happened is that it was delivered not in the proper setup, yeah? So, so the, the big message is that this lateral, for example, is a procedure that is technically very demanding. And if you're not willing to take all the steps that are required, then you can have this kind of uh, experience. I don't know if you want to expand on that, Praveen, or any of the other faculties, maybe the senior people, um, Dr. Kostowit or, or uh, Nick. There's a, obviously, there's a steep learning curve to all this stuff. I think Juan makes a good point in being prepared. We push the envelope. I mean, that, that case particularly got a lot of attention, obviously, but I agree 100% doing those things in outpatient setting does potentially set you, yourself up. A -lift, I do a lot of a -lift still. The vascular surgeon, bottom line is, he opens up a beautiful exposure. Every once in a while, we get into a vessel. I, I put my finger on it. He comes back in and closes it. We've never lost anybody, and we, and we never will. The, the, it just depends on you know setting the system up so that the for the safety of the patient. As we move towards an outpatient setting, people are, go, are doing things laterals, a lifts, and stuff. In outpatient setting, I'm not going to disagree with that, but it, but you're in charge, so you, those, you guys have to in your practice are going to have to make that decision. That's going to be your responsibility. And the take home message is do the right thing for the patient. So those things garner a lot of attention, but doesn't necessarily. You shouldn't be casting a bad light on the procedures once. It has to be all has to do with how you set things up to, to take care of complications, which are going to occur anterior, posterior, front, back, sideways, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's that's absolutely correct. Um, I've had my share of complications, and I'll be first to line up and uh, and do a mea culpa of things that I thought were going to be fine didn't turn out well. Um, you know, in this specialty, that's what happens. Um, but there is the option of setting yourself for maximum options of success, and then there is this, this situation of not thinking of the really bad things that happen, you know, one in 100,000 times that can really alter the way that you practice your, your specialty. So, um, you know, you got to just keep an eye on that, and I think we talk a lot about these kinds of MIS stuff, and you, you hear a lot of very positive talks, but we got to talk about the complications, too, because I think those are underreported. Um, I know of some iliac tears at my institution, um, two of them that I can think of that were repaired but lost a lot of blood, um, and, you know, we, they don't really get reported sometimes, and so we got to talk to talk to each other about it and just uh, be open so that we know what to, what to watch out for. So... Uh, these were the uh, other complications that uh, are common with lateral approaches, some sensory redicts, some motor redicts. A lot of these do resolve. Um, that's true, but you got to tell the patients about it beforehand that you might wake up, your thigh might be a bit numb, it's probably going to get better. 
Um, this was Juan's picture uh, from his article. I'm going to pick on Juan since he's here and he's my friend. Um, but he did a nice, beautiful job here of taking that rotational, relatively mild to moderate curve, and then doing it all anterior and straightening it out. And he put it in the in the article. And I said, I said, Juan, what happened to this patient? Because uh, you you didn't have long term follow up. And he told me that he had pseudos and some of the screws broke. Juan, is that right? So yeah. And he yeah. The, that's right. That's exactly right. And so one third of the patients in that article did not have their sagittal balance restored. And it's not the coronal correction that's important. It's the sagittal correction. Um, and so this is something that we all learn from. And you know, when you start doing something new and you don't realize all the things that are involved, we have to evolve and learn and figure out what we have to do to be better. And uh, you know, this is not to say I didn't have my own troubles. Um, Mike Wang and I looked at this um, series in 2010 in NS Focus, and what we figured out was we can't rely on our posterior lateral fusions through a tube. And so uh, what happened was the patients who um, had inner bodies, the inner bodies tended to fuse. The patients who I tried to put a tube down, wrap up the facet joints at the top of my construct, and pack in some iliac crest autograft into the joints through a tube, a lot of those got pseudos. And uh, so um, you know, that's also another issue that we've got to think about if we're going to do these procedures and you're not going to do an inner body at every level, are you going to get pseudos? Or if you are going to add an inner body at every level, you're making the surgery bigger and more expensive. So other things that we've got to talk about and what is the role of off-label BMP and that kind of stuff for here, um, I won't really get into here because it's beyond the scope of this talk. So the question becomes when to do MIS for deformity. It's not everybody who is a candidate. Um, in the minimally invasive subgroup of the ISSG, we have all these folks here, many of them in the room who are involved, and Juan and Adam are here, and um, Mike Wang, et cetera. Uh, Shaffrey and Lenke also help with this. And essentially, we wanted to figure out who is a good candidate to have an MIS surgery. So we came up with this little table, which I think as of 2014 was fairly accurate, and you know, times will change and people will get better, and maybe this will be modified in the future. But this is the way I essentially approach these patients when they come to my clinic. We figure out what is their SVA. If their SVA is less than six centimeters, then you're probably going to be candidates for MIS surgery, because MIS surgery has limited ability to correct your sagittal imbalance. Um, so an SVA of, of less than six is you know, sort of moderate. SVA correction needed. Then the question becomes, what is their pelvic tilt? They have a low pelvic tilt. They don't have much LLPI mismatch. Now I'm going down the left side of this here. They don't have lateral olisthesis much. They don't have coronal cobs that are very high. So it's a relatively mild curve. Those people can get away with an MIS surgery with a decompression through a tube. Or if they have a one level listhesis that's mobile causing some back pain, you can certainly do a single level fusion for them. Relatively small surgery. You don't have to really correct their lumbar parameters because they're relatively mild. Now, most people who do MIS surgery end up in this category here, which is a class two. Uh, they may have an SVA less than six, or the, sorry, an SVA more than six. Um, so it might be even eight. But it's a flexible curve in that if you lie them down, they're still able to get their head back on the table. The, the spine is flexible, and, and they're not stuck in a fixed kyphotic position that's fused. So if they have this kind of thing, and they have an LLPI mismatch of under 30 degrees, you can probably get about 20 plus degrees of correction with MIS techniques as they stand today fairly easily. And they don't have thoracic kyphosis then they're going to end up in this class two category. And in this class two category, basically what happens is you can do MIS perk screws and either laterals or MIS T lifts through the tube or do A lifts and then back them up with perk screws. So some combination of things with uh, MIS techniques if they're in this sort of middle category. Now, if they have a rigid curve of 10 centimeters, now I'll pay a mismatch of like 50, 60 degrees and a huge thoracic kyphosis. Uh, based on today's technology, it's very hard to get that corrected MIS. Now we just do it open. Um, and so that's how I think about these patients. And so not everybody who comes through goes to straight to MIS deformity surgery. Some of them I still do open. So let's look at some cases. Uh, this is a class one where the MIS decompression without fusion or with just a limited fusion is fine. It's a patient with a relatively mild curve. There's not really any sagittal imbalance. Uh, the patient complains primarily of leg pain. There is a, a disc in the lateral recess, and for sure you could drop a tube, take out the disc, and you don't really need to do much else here. The patient's going to be just fine with a relatively straightforward operation. Here, uh, again, is the, is the summary of doing the level one treatment, neurogenic, 
nerve root related symptoms, requires a limited decompression. They often don't have much back pain because they really don't have a bad curve. Uh, and if they did have a little listhesis, you could do a single level fusion, but they don't have global imbalance. They have relatively small Cobb angles, not really any LLPI mismatch, and they don't need anything really big if they fall into this category. And this is the more common one that you see people doing MIS uh, deformity surgery. Uh, these are patients who have back pain associated with their deformity, typically LLPI mismatch of, of up to 30 degrees. They often have some listhesis or lateral listhesis. And if you get more than six millimeters of lateral listhesis, there's a chance likelihood that that could progress. And that's why we wrote six millimeters into the algorithm. And uh, you know, Cobb angles over 20 degrees. And those we can do, as shown here, T-lift through the tube, some perk screws, and I'll show you a video, but what I like to do is make a, a skin incision, I keep the fascia intact, and I go through the fascia, um, rather than through the skin making multiple stab holes. That's just a personal preference of mine. Some people would do multiple stab holes. So this is a case example of that, uh, is a 67-year-old typical patient who has this problem with low back pain, bilateral sciatica, uh, who failed multiple steroid injections, is on oral narcotics, and has uh, this curve, uh, a moderate curve. It's not a severe curve. She has some SBA imbalance. It's not terrible. Um, and so, um, you know, if we did do this MIS, and again, she has the multiple foraminal stenosis and common things that you see on these kinds of patients. And so, um, you know, I did laterals at L2 to 5, and then an L2 to S1 pedicle screw fixation with a T-lift at the bottom. And then uh, this is the intraoperative photo. So um, uh, putting the, uh, the uh, percutaneous screws through the fascia and uh, putting a tube in for my T-lift. And then um, basically correcting the curve with the rod reduction maneuver and um, with uh, uh, tabs on the screws, you can essentially reduce the spine back to straight. And so that's what she gets. And um, I like to do one iliac screw rather than two. Uh, you can do two, but Sig Bourbon and I did a paper out of UCSF looking at, for most patients, if you get away with one. And what's the reason anyway that we put in an iliac screw on these cases? Uh, let's ask. Um, trip nanny. To make the construct. Well, what are, what are the indications in general for iliac fixation? For basically the number of levels you're trying to fuse. Okay. What number of levels you're trying to fuse typically would you include, include an iliac screw? Like four. Four. Okay. So if you're going to S1, then what would be the top level that you would need an iliac screw if you say four? L2 or That's one. right. Yeah, I, I would quote that. In fact, uh, I've got a little table of that in, in one of my articles. L2 to S1 or longer fusion. You put an iliac screw in. What complication are you trying to avoid by putting an iliac fixation? Pseudoarthrosis. OK, that's definitely one complication you're trying to avoid. Any others? Pseudoarthrosis where specifically? At the bottom. Yep, that's right. L5S1. OK. And what else? Um, and then uh, I guess PJK. Right? Mm, no, it doesn't really help you with PJK. That's at the opposite end of the construct. Yeah. There's one other complication that I worry about in someone who's 60-something with some osteopenia and a long construct. What am I trying to avoid? Osteopenia being the key factor there. Like fracture? A fracture of what? Uh, the sacrum? Yes, sacral insufficiency fracture. For these kinds of cases, those are the main two reasons why you do iliac fixation. You want to avoid sacral insufficiency fracture or, or premature loosening of your S1 screws. And that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. So um, but we found that in, in patients who have relatively mild sacral slopes that you can get away with one rather than two. And so I've been doing that, save some cost. Um, so uh, I told you I'd show you a video. Maybe that's a different I didn't see you there. Now, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He's one of our residents, so I'm just making fun. Of him. What was that? Maybe seeing a difference in the outcome of one or two. Like, uh, yeah. So where we saw a difference is if the uh, patients had a high grade spinal thesis, or if they had a very high sacral slope, then there was a tendency for one to fail. For but most cases that I do, I tend to use one. Except in a high grade listhesis case, I will put two, because once that fails, you're unhappy. Question. Yes. Does it matter if you have an S2 ALAR or? No, I think that's fine. No, no, that's good. Either way. OK. 
Why aren't you working? There we go. What am I doing? No, I usually do just a regular iliac. The way that I put the iliac in, um, I don't know if it's in this video, uh, is that um, you know I line it up right with the S1 screw head because I choose a, an entry point that's uh, medial to the PSIS, uh, a little superior, and so um, I can usually just drop the rod right in. Full conversion to S2 ALR iliac because open. I I have fully converted to S2 ALR iliac screws. What are you doing, Tyler? I'm still, and I'll talk about it in my my talk. But I'm mostly a iliac screw, but I'll do S2 ALR iliacs in certain circumstances. But and I'll tell you the reasons why when we get through it. But perfect. You got a comment back there? Yeah, David Hanscom here at Swedish. Um, you know, it's been the latest out there, and I've been watching this at the SRS for a couple of years, and this is my 30th year doing spinal deformity surgery, and I don't think that patient's a surgical candidate. So I'm concerned about the pelvic angles, quote, lordosis, that those are becoming a reason to do surgery, and these are patients we're rehabbing all the time. We're getting sleep under control, the stress, medications, physical therapy. We do a structured, systematic rehab approach. They don't need surgery. So this is a huge concern for me, is watching this trend take place. I realize we have to push the limits to some degree, but a fusion to fusion, whether it's minimally invasive or open, we just saw some big complications from X-lifts. We've had our complications here with X-lifts, but this is a patient we would have rehabbed. So I'm not saying this is not the standard of care or not. I just want to put the controversy out there, but we're sort of headlong into this measurement of pelvic parameters flat slash fusions. And my fellows are asking me these questions, and you know, my fellows that are here know that we just simply don't sur do surgery anymore in these particular patients. So, um, what do you mean? What do you mean these particular patients? Well, the patients get the, basically the head over the pelvis. I mean, if they're within five centimeters of being balanced, we can stretch out the hip flexors. We put them in the gym. We get the hip extensors going. I mean, you can do a lot with the pelvic girdle because what happens? Unfortunately, I'm not 20 years old anymore. My hip girdle is tight. I'm a hard time putting on my shoes, which is very humbling. But guess what? These tissues get tight. And the physical therapists that are good manual therapists can do a wonderful job of getting the hip flexors stretched out and the hip extensors strengthened. So, they, I mean, there's never one answer. It's always a combination of things. We're also seeing, anyway, it's a, I don't want to get too much into this topic, but um, we just have developed a really, we call it a prehab process. And we'll talk about this on Sunday, but we now have 53 patients with tight stenosis, instabilities, all sorts of flat backs that have been on the surgical schedule that have canceled their surgeries because they're doing fine. So this whole pain threshold thing is a big deal. And again, I think our biggest steps in spine surgery are gonna become from better rehab patient selection. The technology is incredible. I think it's necessary in a phase that we've all gone through. But I'm really concerned about the fellows the last five years coming into our fellowship with the idea that we can just fix things with surgery. We have a lot of, we're not seeing patients in clinic long term anymore like we used to. So I think the surgical decision making is a big deal. So I just want to put that out there. I'm, I'm you know, no, I think I think you raise a fantastic point. In these courses, we we tend to have a heavy, heavy preponderance towards, hey, this is what we do. These are the surgeries. These are the techniques. Let's get into the lab. Let's learn the techniques. When the fact of the matter is that most of us spend most of our time in clinic avoiding surgery in patients. And and that's where I still that's where I view the, the the value of a of a fellowship still remains. I mean, I think it's fantastic, Praveen, that we're quizzing these younger residents who are understanding these principles. And this is great that you guys four years ago the people in your shoes didn't know what spinal pelvic parameters were, didn't understand these principles. You have to you have to learn these principles. You have to learn the interventions, and then you need to spend some time with people who have experience with this in clinic, which is the education at the end of what it is that you're doing. The education's in clinic. They hate, you hate clinic. I hate clinic. I hate clinic. Are you kidding me? I mean, I am, I am mentally and physically exhausted at the end of a clinic day. It sucks. But it is, it is, it is, the success of the surgery is not, is is much more predicted by the decision that was made in clinic than the execution in the operating room. Right, but see, I actually love clinic. 
I mean, I, I, I'm actually, I, 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 seriously, I, I would love to teach anybody here how I flat out come out of my clinic fired up every time. And there's a whole art to not engage in patients that are difficult, of letting go. And there, it's wonderful when these patients get excited about their rehab and their sleep's better and they're excited, their new relationships are developing, their pain's better, and our post-operative care is better. They're in Tylenol within two weeks after major fusions. So we love clinic. We absolutely love clinic. So it's actually very time-effective treating chronic pain. Um, you resource it out. It's, it's not hard. So we have the. I come to clinic energized every time. Yeah. And I'm total, yeah. 40 years of doing surgery. Complex. When I retired, 40 years of doing complex surgery. When I retired, what I missed most was talking to the patients. You find out. It's like I don't know how many of you are Catholic, but when you go to confession, you know, the patients confess to you. They talk about all their problems. If you want to listen, yeah, and I, I'm glad to hear that because, uh, believe it or not, it, yes, all these techniques are fancy and it looks great, and you can become an amazing a technician. But, but I would say the biggest advance you see our paper from 2010 and what we have right now is actually we learn now to uh, selection and find the better candidates for this technique or that technique based on all the knowledge, more than, than the techniques itself. So, uh, like, don't forget what Ben Sel always say, you know, a dome with a tool still is a dump, you know. And, and is, is more, more powerful by learning how to select what patient is good for what. And, and unfortunately, this one comes with time and in the clinic. So uh, I know we hate it, as David said, but so important to be able to recognize what this patient needs and what is he looking for. Because sometimes, actually, they play with us, you know? They use us as a way to get what they want. You know, disability, more attention from the wives, the boyfriend, whatever, you know? So, so you need to be careful. And you learn, unfortunately, by doing it every week and seeing everyone. All right, good. So um, I think it's very important to hear viewpoints uh, that are very different. Um, how I approach these patients now, how I approached them five years ago, very different. Who I select for surgery now, who I selected a few years ago, very different. Um, I will say that you know a patient comes into my clinic with the x-ray, like the ones that I showed, uh, the first step is not the OR. Um, usually I, I end up getting a uh, you know, a series of conservative management things that, to get done. You know, we try injections, we try physical therapy, and it's only when they get to the end of their road that I offer surgery. Um, perhaps the rehab stuff that's done here is, is better than what we have, um, and, uh, and maybe we should learn from that too. Um, but uh, I will tell you that I do uh, try to get a, a relationship with the patient, and it's because these are fairly big operations. Um, there's something that could go wrong in at least, you know, one out of five or one out of four of these patients. Um, the more that you know the patient, the more trust that they have in you, the more that you get to know their family, the easier it is to have those conversations, the complications on the, on the other side of the fence, too. Um, and, you know, it's also nice to have someone come in the clinic, give you a hug and some cookies. That's always good. Now, I probably don't need the cookies. I can use the hugs. So... Uh, but uh, I, I do think that some of those points are really quite valid. Um, but I'll go back to the topic of the talk, which was MIS deformity. And um, so here what we've done is um, I positioned this patient on an open bottom table. I opened the skin. I didn't open the fascia. And uh, this is putting in the uh, tubular retractor in order to um, access for the TLIF. And so... I'll just go forward through this because I don't want to keep you from lunch. Keeping resins from lunch usually is not good. So uh, I did a T-lift on one side and a T-lift contralaterally on the next adjacent level simultaneously. So this at this year, I think it was John Zewax was the fellow. But uh, so you can see he's doing his T-lift from his side. I'm doing my T-lift from my side to save time uh, through uh, bilateral tubular retractors. And, um, you know, we take the shavers, we take out the disc, and I think that some of the things that I see, the resins coming through for fellowships, uh, don't take enough time to take the disc out. Um, I really rough up the end plates, and I take a lot of time to take that disc out, because uh, trying to put a cage in to a, a level that has a bunch of disc in it is just not going to fuse, and I tend to use iliac crest for these, and so this patient had 
um, some alifs, uh, and we took some crest. Where do I get the crest? Through the same incision by taking an Army Navy and pulling laterally at the base of the incision. Uh, I take a bone funnel full of crest and I pack that in there and then cage goes in, et cetera, et cetera. And then we go ahead and put in cage on the opposite side. Uh, and uh, then we're going to be putting in, I got a cannulated gear shift, so we're going to be putting in screws with that. And then K wires I don't really like because they go in all kinds of weird places. You got to be careful with them. Um, but essentially we do K wires, taps, put in the screws, put in the rod. Uh, and I'll go on with the rest of this. And we can review some of that stuff in the lab today too, or tomorrow, depending on what the schedule looks like. So uh, you can place iliac screws as well. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the topic of S2AI screws since Koski's going to talk about it. Uh, and um, you know there are some issues of complications. I think it's it's important to talk about uh, what are the complications of the MIS surgery not restoring the sagittal balance, um, focusing too much on the coronal curve, not getting a solid fusion, uh, not matching your lumbar lordosis to your pelvic incidence. Uh, I think those are all important things for you to remember. Uh, and those are uh, some of the issues that we pointed out in recent papers. And there is a, a ceiling effect to how bad the deformity is and how effectively you can do it with MIS. And some of this may be changing with newer procedures coming along like um, ACR release, et cetera. But, those have complications, and I'm not going to go into all those details right now either. Uh, so, you know, take home per points here. Remember, your pelvic instance is a fixed parameter. Your, your lordosis should be within 10 degrees of your pelvic instance. That is your goal. Um, you know, people temporarily compensate with their pelvic tilt. Uh, they can't do it forever, and that's when they get tired and fatigued and get the back muscle spasms. And these are the kinds of curves you want to avoid MIS surgery. Uh, big cob curves uh, that are rigid uh, with very high SVAs um, and a lot of lateral allosthesis. Um, and this kind of case here is probably going to require an open osteotomy. Uh, and this one we did a VCR in order to get this patient corrected. And doing small things on, on this kind of case is not going to be effective. What you're going to be doing is multiple small things until you end up doing the big definitive surgery. So I'll leave you with a few additional thoughts. If anybody you want us to come and hang out in San Francisco in July 2017, give me a shout. Uh, the NSCNS spine section this year, um, in memory of Charlie Koontz, has 30 awards for residents with cash prizes of $500 to $1,000. So if you um, get a platform talk there, uh, you get a check. And so I would encourage all of you to submit. Um, I'm trying to get the word out, and um, we hope to see many of you at the Spine Section meeting March 16 to 19. It's in Orlando uh, at the Universal Studios, Lowe's, and there's also fellow prizes as well. Some of you may be fellows, and this year we have the Dr. Jane Award, $1,500 prize, top fellow uh, or senior chief resident to submit uh, a, a talk to the Spine Section. So, um, and the uh, honored guest this year, Chris Shaffrey, who I think wandered in the back somewhere, and Larry Lenke. And uh, so we hope to see you in Orlando. Thanks very much. Thank you.